in our last study in this letter, we were reading through and looking at verses 12 to 14 of chapter 2, at the different stages of Christian growth from children through young men to fathers. And perhaps like me, you ask the question, what is the link between these stages of growth in grace? What will enable me to go on from one stage to another? What is common to all the stages of maturity? I'll admit to you that I came to the verses concerning young men who overcome the evil one. And I had to say, well, perhaps I'm not even at that stage because in me there is so much that is sinful. Perhaps I'm still a child in my faith. Perhaps some people would go further and wonder whether even though they, whether they walk in the light at all. Despite their faith in Christ, despite their conversion experience, what they see talks of something else. But I believe that John is answering these questions and doubts that we have from chapter 1 and verse 5 through to verse 17 of chapter 2. And in verse 15, he gives the link between the stages. He gives the place where we might find the strength to grow in grace. Where we might get for ourselves encouragement. When we agonize over our sin, he simply gives a command. Do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. And I want us to think through this morning that command that John gives not to love the world. I suppose the first thing that strikes us is these very words are used in John's Gospel. God loved the world. And therefore should not we love the world? Does it mean that we hate everything in the world? and are negative about everything this world offers? Have we to hide ourselves in a monastery? Let's just notice two things. John goes on in verse 16 to define the world and things of the world. What worldliness is? He writes, For everything in the world, the cravings of sinful man, the lust of his eyes and the boasting of what he has and does. That's what John is concerned about. And that's what he's concerned that we avoid. Being the kind of people who in morality and ethic, in value, in lifestyle, are no different to other people in the world. And we are worldly people. Do you see what else constitutes this kind of person? In verse 15, he's devoid of love for the Father. He does not exhibit what the Father called us to, as exemplified in our Lord Jesus Christ. Do you remember those words back in chapter 2 and verse 6? Whoever claims to live in him must walk as Jesus did, and we look back to our Lord's genuine and authentic humanity. And we look at his life in the Gospels and seek to live in the way that he lived. But it's very striking too the way John uses the word love, isn't it? It's the word that's akin to the Christian love that we're so used to. But here it's used of loving the world. It's the love that's self-sacrificial, self-giving. It's the kind of love that is a steady devotion of the will. And again, that is what John is anxious to persuade these people of. Is your attitude to this world a steady devotion of your will to doing whatever it calls? To whatever standard it has? Allowing the cravings of our sinful man, the lust of our eyes to go totally unchecked, to give ourselves to them, or perhaps to ignore them or cultivate them like the world. 
We've been created with desires. We have eyes. We're in the world. But do you see John's great desire for these believers is not to capitulate habitually to sin, but rather to master it and have as their ever-present attitude and habit not to live like the world, not to love the world. And yet we look at ourselves and we see that we're tempted. We see that we do sin. And we question whether we're God's people at all, perhaps. And we need, before we have a look at that command, to clear up about sin in this world and sin in the Christian. Let's go back to chapter 1 and verse 8 where John gives one of those claims that he finds in the church already in in his day. He writes, if we claim to be without sin, that is, if we claim that sin does not exist in our natures, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. He presses upon believers right from the very beginning that sin is found even in Christian people. We cannot deny it. We cannot try to ignore it and say it doesn't exist. We need, as he goes on to say, to confess it. Do you see back in verse 7, 2, he tells us very plainly, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. Even when we walk in the light, says John, we will still have sin to confess. And God continues his task of cleansing us from sin. You see, the reality of our situation is very simple. We are justified by grace through faith. But we still live in our earthly life in earthen vessels with a fallen nature. The Apostle Paul deals with this theme in the book of Romans, where he says that that even though the dominion of sin is broken for believers, the presence of sin still remains in our natures. And that's the problem, is it not, for children, for young men and fathers? Which is why for each of them in verse 15 he goes on to say, Sin may be active and present in your life seeking to incite rebellion against God. But we must not love the world. We need, as it were, to get to grips with ourselves, to train ourselves in godliness. Or as the hymn writer says, to subdue all that is not holy. Says John, have as your constant attitude, prayer and directive, not loving the world, which is society apart from God and all that godless society holds. But master yourself, confess your sin. So let's think more carefully and more clearly about these words in verse 15. What does it mean for us? For us who have the failings of verse 16. If we're to prevent what comes naturally. If we're to master the worldliness in us. What does it mean? It means that we deal with the very source of sin in ourselves, is it not? we get to the very heart of the matter of worldliness in our lives. And I want us therefore this morning, very briefly and only under two heads, to think through not loving this world. First, why we must deal with sin. And in the second place, how we may deal with sin. I know it's very obvious. I know we've gone through these themes time and again. 
But you see, even for fathers in the faith, John still gives the same command. Do not love the world. For all ages and stages of Christian experience, we need to be reminded again and again of our our, our essential Christian view of this world. So in the first place, why do we need to deal with sin? We need to deal with sin, first of all, because of the aims of sin. Cast your mind back to Genesis chapter 4 and verse 7, where God speaks to Cain just before he murders his brother Abel. Do you remember what God says to him? Sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you, but you must master it. Do you see, that's the aim of sin in our lives, is to have us, is to master us. Satan observed that righteous man Job and wanted to have him too. It wasn't his possessions, that was merely the way in which he was trying to get at the man himself. He was trying to destroy the man Job's confession. Do you remember too how Jesus says to the disciples in Luke chapter 22, Satan demanded to sift you as wheat, to scatter them. You see, that's the aim of sin in our own lives. Sin aims at captivating us again to our original state of separation from God. It seeks to draw us away from God. And we need to battle against that aim in our lives and recognize it. Rugby has been in the news very much recently. Can you imagine a player getting the rugby ball and herring across the field to the the opponent's try line? And just a yard before he gets to the line, he he stops. And says, I'm only kidding, I'm not really going to score a try. It doesn't really matter that I beat you. It's not really the aim of the game after all. I'm just kidding. My dear friends, the aim of sin is not kidding in our lives. It demands to sift us and to have us. And the aim of sin, you see, is to cloud the light of the gospel. Cause us not to conquer sin, but to be beaten by it. And we need to deal with sin simply because of its aim. To draw us away from God. To draw us back into the dominion of sin. So that's the aim of sin. But in the second place, we need to recognize, as Paul did in Romans... That sin isn't passive within our lives, it is active. It is actively hostile to all that God is wanting to do in our lives in this world. It's active in tempting us to misuse or to misappropriate any of God's good gifts that he's given to us as his creatures. Have you noticed that when Paul gives an outline of what sin is, what our sinful nature is. Much that sin is, is simply misappropriating what God has given. We have a God consciousness created in us, but it becomes idolatry or witchcraft or self-worship. God has given us the harvest of fruits, but what does it become? It becomes drunkenness. God has given us many good gifts and it becomes all manner of immorality. You see, sin actively wants to use unlawfully God's gifts. Do you remember how Paul, looking at himself, writes these words in Romans chapter 7 and verse 19? What I do is not the good I want to do. No, the evil I do not want to do, that I keep on doing. 
But you know the real folly that there is, is that even though we know sin is actively present and hostile in our lives, what do we do? We toy with it. We let our imaginations go in sin, do we not? That's what Paul is dealing with in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 when he begins by going through the life of Israel in the, in the desert and he details the way in which God was not pleased with them and therefore he judges them. And in verse 6 of 1 Corinthians chapter 10, Paul writes these words, These things occurred as examples to keep us from setting our hearts on evil things as they did. And he writes in those words simply because that is what the Corinthians were doing. They were setting their hearts on evil things. And you remember how he goes on in verse 13 with those wonderful words, No temptation has seized you except what is common to man. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can stand up under it. But do you notice what verse 14 says? Therefore, my dear friends, flee. And the reason Paul says that in verse 14 is that's exactly what people don't do in temptation. We don't flee. We toy with the sin that's before us. We taste it, we savour it, we enjoy the smell of it, we keep looking at it. And what's the inevitable result? We fall in temptation, do we not? That doesn't question the faithfulness of God because he gives a way of escape each time. But it shows the folly of our nature for we stay we ask ourselves, I wonder how far we can go in this. I wonder if I'll not get caught. And we stay and we presume upon the kindness of God. Perhaps in those circumstances you've said to yourself, but the blood of Christ will cleanse me from all sin. But you see, that precious blood doesn't keep us at liberty within sin. The precious blood of Christ cleanses us from sin, from its guilt and its power. And the blood of Christ washes sin away. We say, but we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. Jesus Christ who died and was raised. But my dear friends, just as we will share in his resurrection on the last day, Every day through our lives we share in his dying to, his dying to sin. We cannot presume upon the kindness of God because the blood has been given to cleanse us from sin. We deal with sin because it is actively present in our lives and hostile to all that God intends to do. But in the third place, we need to deal with sin because our sin hardens other people to the gospel. Let me give you just a brief example. I was reading Professor Bruce's book on 1 John and he defines worldliness, loving the world, as conforming to the world and its thought. And as an academic, he goes on to say that it's not just in morality and ethics, But worldliness is also evident when theologians attempt, as he writes, to restate the gospel in terms of the present climate of opinion, in philosophy and theology and so on, which restatement of the gospel bears no relation at all to the original. And he says that's just as worldly as immorality and no ethics. And you know, I've lost count of the number of times I've read Muslims or heard Muslims who cite Christian theologians 
to support their own case against Christ, especially the bodily resurrection. They say Christian thinkers today. Do you notice the way they say Christian thinkers? Christian thinkers today don't believe in the bodily resurrection. And that's what Islam has been teaching for 1300 years. And you see worldliness invaded into the church. Worldliness invading into our own lives prevents other people from seeing the truth of the gospel. Is it not true for us at home and at work? By the way in which we live, by what we say, do we harden other people to the gospel? Says John, we need to deal with worldliness within ourselves for the sake of the gospel amongst people who are as yet outside of Christ. Dealing with ourselves so that we give no one else an excuse but I never saw the gospel because of him. So we need to deal with sin within ourselves because it may harden other people to the gospel. But in the fourth place, we need to deal with sin. Says Paul in Romans chapter 8 and verse 13, because the strength and power of our spiritual walk with God depends on the way in which we deal with sin. Romans chapter 8 and verse 13. If you live according to the sinful nature, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. Do you see the link the Apostle makes between dealing with sin in ourselves, dealing with worldliness in ourselves? And the way we live and flourish as Christians. If by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. And in living you will grow from, in, from a childlike faith to a mature faith. So the power and strength of our spiritual war depends on dealing with sin in ourselves. But in the last place, and I suppose it's very significant as all the rest are, we need to deal with sin in ourselves because of the gravity of sin. Why is sin, sin? It is sin because God names it sin. God himself has defined for us what sin is. He has told us time and again in his word what he loathes, what he will judge. And my dear friends, we dare not contradict God and dismiss as something light what he has said. Verse 15 talks of the love of the Father. Do you remember how the love of God is shown? God demonstrated his love to us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. In one of the crematoria that I have been in, there's a big picture of the risen Christ with the words, I am the resurrection around it. But if you look very closely at that picture of the risen Christ, you'll see no gashes in his head. You'll see no prints of nails in his hands and his feet. And there is no evidence of a wound in his side. But he's the risen Christ. Is that not the way so often we think of sin and the death of Christ? Sin really doesn't matter. It's not really so bad. And after all, God's, go God's a God of love and he'll overlook it. And the cross and its meaning is devalued and passed by. It'll be all right when I get to heaven. It'll be, as they say, all right on the night. 
Is that how you conceive of sin? It's a matter of indifference, really. God has seen it entirely in a different light and that is the way we must see it and view it. We deal with sin because it is sin against God himself. Because God has defined it as sin. And indeed, even though we find sin in our lives, we don't count it lightly as Christian believers, do we? We grieve over our sin at the least time in which we go against God. And we loathe it and seek to be washed and freed from it. So my dear brothers and sisters, we need to deal with sin because of its aim. Because it is actively hostile to all that God is seeking to do. Because sin in our lives can harden other people to the gospel. It's only when we deal with sin that we have any hope of flourishing in our Christian walk. And we need to deal with sin because God has called it sin. And God hates to see it. So these are the reasons why we must deal with sin and very briefly. How can we deal with sin? How can we overcome it in our lives? Let me in the first place give you an example of how we, don't, we need not deal with sin. How we don't deal with sin. Do you remember the words of Jesus when he says, if your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out? And there are many people who have taken that quite literally and done all kinds of things to their bodies. There was one Christian father who took a couple of bricks and emasculated himself. But you see, my brothers and sisters, that will only render us less likely to sin in a certain way. It doesn't deal with the fountainhead of sin. It doesn't deal with the source from which sin comes in our own lives. We need to deal with sin right at its very source. We need to deal with sin and strangulate it from where it wells up in our being. The way in which we deal with sin in the first place is to deal with it by grace when we abide in Christ. Do you remember the, pict the metaphor John gives us in chapter 15 of his gospel concerning the vine and the branches? How do the branches maintain vigor? How are the branches able to bear fruit? They remain attached to the vine itself and they draw goodness that flows through the plant. And in the same way, we need to draw upon Christ's strength, the power of his death and resurrection and exaltation into heaven. It's very significant in that very chapter. Do you remember the words John says? Without me, you can do nothing. And if we're wanting to deal with sin in our own selves, without Christ, we can do nothing. And we deal with it, you see, according to the means of grace that Christ has given to us. In the first place, using Scripture. How often when we're at the very point of our need, when we need to read the Bible most, do you find yourself laying it aside and not reading it? But that's the height of folly, isn't it? Because it's the source from which we draw strength from Christ. Which is what we find in chapter 2 and verse 14 of 1 John. The word of God dwells or lives in you. That's how we draw strength. We draw strength too when we pray for a genuine hatred of sin. When we get to grips with praying concerning sin in our own lives. And as we enjoy fellowship with one another and with God, we deal with sin first and foremost, you see, as we draw upon the strength that comes from Christ. But in the second place, we deal with sin with the help and the aid of the Holy Spirit. 
Do you notice in verse 15 of the passage which we read, do not love the world or anything in the world? If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Do you remember how the New Testament says the love of Christ is shed abroad in our hearts? Romans chapter 5 and verse 5, the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit. And as we read in chapter 8 and verse 13, that same Holy Spirit who by which we put to death the deeds of the flesh. You see, it's the Holy Spirit within us that causes us to bear the fruit of the Spirit. We can't do that ourselves. It's by the aid of the Holy Spirit as He works in us to will and to act according to the good pleasure of God. For you see, when the Holy Spirit works in us, He gets right to the root, to the habit of our sin. He himself sharpens our conscience. He enables us to grow strong in our faith. And as we were reading in John chapter 14 to 16, thinking about it a wee while ago, it's the Holy Spirit, isn't it, who placards the Lord Jesus Christ before us and brings to us the power of the death and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. So we deal with that by abiding in Christ. We deal with ourselves with the aid of the Holy Spirit. But in the last place, we deal with it by mastering ourselves. Let me quote again those words from Romans chapter 8 and verse 13. You're probably thinking I would love to have expanded that verse instead of the passage before us. The Apostle Paul writes, If by the Spirit you put to death. We're not passive, you see, says the Apostle Paul. We need to do it. We can't say, but listen, this is a natural disposition of mine. It's a weakness that I have. I know it's against the law of God, but I'm unable to do it. God doesn't listen to that kind of thinking. He says, do it anyway. I remember a wee while ago when, before I started training for the ministry, I was a bit concerned about doing something in the church halls. And I mentioned to Mr. Alexander that I was a wee bit nervous. And he pointed me towards the front and he put his finger in my back and just pushed me. Do it anyway. It's not easy, but you do it anyway. Now that England has been beaten, I suppose it's okay now to mention the match before, the week before at Murrayfield. I remember hearing the Scots coach complain that the English squad didn't allow the Scots rugby team to have any flowing rugby because every time a Scottish player got the ball what happened? He was clamped down immediately he was tackled but isn't that what we need to do concerning our thoughts? when Paul talks about his thoughts in 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 5 he says this I hold every thought captive to make it obedient to Christ. That's what we need to do, isn't it? Whenever we begin to think along a certain line, we need to make it captive and to stop it before it grows, before it begins to get out of hand and before we slip and fall. We need to know too the tactics of our enemy, don't we? Because even after Jesus was tempted by the devil in the wilderness. Do you remember those words? He left Jesus to seek another opportune time. My brothers and sisters, we need to work on ourselves. We need to hold every thought captive and make it obedient to Christ. 
So when the Apostle says, do not love the world or anything in the world, we do it by mastering ourselves, by the Holy Spirit, as we abide in Christ and draw on all his resources. And then the words in verse 17 will come about. The man who does the will of God will inherit eternal life. Amen.